Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, thanks for the great introductory. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We realize this is a busy time of the year, and there's the holidays going on. Um, so we really appreciate you joining us for this presentation on the 2012 NDS. And um, you might have noted, well, on the title page, it uh, mentions that Buddy Showalter was going to present, but um, unfortunately, He's out sick today. He's actually on the webinar, but he won't be presenting um, because of his illness. He may chime in and tell me I'm not doing something right or something or correct me, but otherwise he'll be in the background, um, and then um, he'll be also asking the questions. So into our presentation, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll go over uh, some of the housekeeping items in the presentation. This presentation is copyrighted by American Wood Council. If you'd like to use any portion of the presentation, you can contact us and we'll help expedite that. Um, also, if you've, hopefully you've downloaded a PDF of the presentation, um, I view that as a resource that you can refer to later on in the presentation and thus, that's why we've included the description and the learning objectives that you saw when you registered for the event. Um, there's also a lot of text in some of these slides, so please be aware that we're not asking you to read the actual slides. Again, this is uh, included in the slides so that you could refer to it at a later time. Now, as Suzanne mentioned, we're going to start incorporating some polls into our presentation, or we are have started. And one easy, very easy question is this first question, which Suzanne will launch right now. Okay, our first poll question today is, what is your profession? So if you want to go ahead and answer that, we'll give you about 45 seconds or see if about 80% of the people have responded. And we're at 80% now. That was quick. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And I'll tell you that we have 2% architects, 84% engineers, 9% code officials, 2% building designers, and 4% others. So the vast majority of our audience is engineers. So welcome, everybody. Yes. Thank you. And that's great. You guys are quick on the draw. That means you're all paying attention. That's awesome. And um, again, thank you for joining us. So just an outline of how we're going to proceed through this presentation. We're going to initially provide you with an overview of the background behind the NDS and how it's related to the codes or adopted in the codes. And then we'll get into LRFD, a primer. We'll give you some background behind that and um, how we've developed uh, our uh, equations for designing with wood in LRFD design. And then we'll get into the body of the presentation, which will go over uh, the chapter-by-chapter -chapter discussion on the National Design Specification, uh, changes from previous edition, which was the 2005 NDS, and then we'll summarize it at the end. And then also at the very end, we'll give you a quick peek at what's going to happen in, uh, coming forward in the 2015 NDS. But for those of you that are seasoned engineers that are used to usually using the NDS, hopefully this will be a good update on where we are in the NDS and give you a refresher course uh, so that you can design more efficiently your wood projects, get you more familiar with the uh, NDS. And then also that for those of you that are new to the NDS, hopefully this gives you an overview of the overall format as well, and then um, again, helping you design more efficiently your wood structures to become familiar with the document. So we'll give more information also at the end of the presentation where you can go to get more in-depth information. Now an overview. For those that aren't familiar with the American Wood Council or the National Design Specification, uh, the actual publication started out in 1944 under the USDA Forest Products Lab. That was the first publication on the national design specifications. And throughout the year, you can see there's been several editions of the publication, um, incorporated new research, a lot of information, um, new products, and there was a big change in 1997 to the 2001 
where we incorporated new products such as the engineered wood products and then uh, also shear walls and di diaphragms were incorporated and a new chapter on fire design. So a huge change from the 97 and the 2001. And then also, um, it was also under the umbrella of the American Forest Products Association, American Forest and Paper Association, excuse me, and um, it was under that umbrella, AWC was uh, reformatted or rechartered in 2010 as the American Wood Council. And that's where, in 2011, I believe, is where we became the official ANSI standard producer of the NDS in 2011. So we've, de we've changed through organizations. The, the main body of it, though, the NDS has continued through the years, and um, now it is officially American Wood Council under our umbrella. Some of you may have seen the reference American uh, AFMPA as the designator of the standard, but now we are. And um, on this, we're actually missing the 2012 NDS, which we'll be talking about. And then we'll also be talking about the 2015 NDS, which is out now. Um, it's been published, and it's available on our website. Um, this is the first time ever that it is a free download in a read-only version from our website, the 2015. But I... Um, wanted to start off with a little bit of history about LRFD and in the 80s is when industry embarked on a program to develop LRFD for wood design and in 1995 AWC and ASCE developed the LRFD standard and the result of that is in 1996 this publication LRFD standard in 2005, we have the NDS, which is the first dual format of ASD and LRFD. And then we continue that dual format to this day. Now, under the IBC, um, some of you may be under 2006 IBC, some of you are in 2009, and maybe even 2012. Well, I think most of the country is now under 2012, but I know that some are still under 2006. But under those two, the 2006 and the 2009, the NDS 2005 edition is adopted. Um, one thing you should note is for the wind and seismic provisions, under the 2006 wind and seismic provisions is only a option or an alternate for using the 2008 wind and seismic provisions. However, under 2009, that's when it became mandatory when you're designing for your lateral design of seismic and wind, it's mandatory under 2009 to use the 2008 wind and seismic provisions. Also, under the 2012 IBC, we adopted the 2008 wind and seismic provisions. Now, it's not till the 2015 where we're going to adopt the 2015 wind and seismic provisions. I know there's a lot of um, additions that I'm throwing out at you. But there is a summary on our website there you could see what uh, has been adopted under which code. Okay, now this is the previous edition 2005. It has 16 chapters and 14 appendices. And as I mentioned under the 2012 IBC, um, it adopts the 2012 NDS, which was approved through the ANSI approval process on August 15, 2011. And this is very important, the ANSI approval process, because it's based on a consensus-based process where we get uh, all the stakeholders involved that have, uh, have the ability to, or they're able to provide feedback on the standards. It's not just the wood industry developing a standard. It's a consensus-based standard. Um, so what's the difference in the changes in the overall format between the 2005 NDS and the 2012? Well, the overall format is the same. It's got 16 chapters and 14 appendices. And um, we'll go through the chapter by chapter on the changes. When you actually order the hard copies of the wood design package, you will see four volumes. In the 2005 volumes, you have the NDS, the wind and seismic provisions, the manual, and the examples. Uh, under the 2012 wood design package, you have the same amount of volumes. However, there is a slight difference. 
in that the 2005 NDS included both the supplement and the NDS all in one volume. In the 2012, however, we break out that supplement and we have the NDS and the supplement as two different volumes. So you're saying, okay, what's missing? Well, the design examples is what's missing from the 2012. You can still utilize the 2005 examples and we are updating that uh, currently, but um, if you design, again, if you design the, uh, or if you use the 2012 NDS, you're going to get the four volumes without the examples. Okay, more, uh, one more important point is that the, to go to our website, um, there, as we know, as something is published, there may be some erratas or addendums to the publications. So this is a link to those addendums. We've included an addendum for the Southern Pine values, but uh, there may be some other addendums and erratas. So be sure to download those from our website for free. Our website is awc.org. Now, on to the LRFD primer and um, the load resistance factor design primer. Now, stepping outside and seeing how, going, um, stepping aside and seeing what we do as designers, we look at a design process and we have a demand. Those are typically the loads that are applied to the structure and then we have a capacity. That's typically your column beams, your structural system that resists those loads. And hopefully your resistance or your capacity of that system is greater than your demand because we don't want to have any failures in our structures. Now the demand can be described as loads, support conditions, geometry. The demand can be so the type of load, whatever type of load or the magnitude, the placement of that load within the system and then the resulting uh, reaction of that load on the system. The capacity on the other hand is geometry, based on geometry, materials and performance. So whatever material of choice that you choose, whatever section properly properties you have for that framing material and how the system behaves under that load is all in the capacity. In this presentation or the NDS, we concentrate on the resistance side, the capacity side. And beyond that, we also may look at fires, economics, aesthetics, construction costs perhaps, um, construction ability. Um, but we're going to concentrate, as I mentioned, on capacity. But we'll give you a little bit idea about the demand side of the equation. Now, in design concepts, we have two basic limit states that we're looking at, and that's how what we use to evaluate a structure or a member, two limit states. One is serviceability. That's the performance in service, how we're evaluating it and then safety against failure or collapse. And we'll go into more depth in the next few slides regarding these two aspects of limit states. When we're talking about serviceability, we're talking about how we appraise a structure as far as its every, everyday usefulness. What's it going, how it's going to react to the loads that are applied and how is it going to perform. And a way of looking at this is when we uh, is to consider the average material elastic values in combination with the real load magnitude. So we're looking at unfactored loads and the average material strength values. And we can get with, uh, it gives us a good uh, look at the structure and we have a great um, determination of structural performance with a good level of precision. So again, we're using unfactored loads and then mean average or uh, material strength values. So when we're looking at safety, however, we're looking at factored loads and material strength values that are modified. And um, safety can be thought of in statistical terms or probability of failure or conversely probability of survival. Using statistical data, we can appraise a structure to make sure that it could withstand the loads and we're not going to have any failures. Now, when we look at ASD design, we use unfactored loads, but oh, my dashboard just went away for some reason. Um, we use unfactored loads, and uh, 
we have, because we have unfactored loads and there's some uncertainty in this loading, we have a very high factor of safety on our capacity side of the equation because we are a resistance side of the equation because we have unfactored loads and we're not sure the we're not as confident in those loads. Now on the LRFD side of the equation or uh, uh, when we're looking at the design we have factored loads and then on the resistance side we have material reference strengths with a resistance factor that's tied to statistical data. Um, so we have ASD versus LRFD. Now when we deal with design though and we're looking at deflection we're going to have unfactored loads for both LRFD and ASD design. So when we're doing LRFD, we'll have to carry all those unfactored loads through our analysis as well as the LRFD. Um, but the one unique uh, benefit of LRFD is that if you have different types of materials, you don't have to do different methodologies that um, different um, unfactored loads throughout the entire equation. You can have it combined with concrete and steel. Now, um, when, how do we tie this to statistical data? And um, I should warn you that I'm not a statistician, but um, I'll, I'll try and explain this as clearly as possible when we, how we tie this all up into statistical data. Right now, we're looking at a normal distribution curves, and on the horizontal axis, we have material property values. And um, this is a symbolic representation of structural property values. On the vertical axis, we have relative frequency. So, for example, we have a curve for uh, these curves over here represent structural framing members. We have visually graded lumber, MSR lumber, glue lamb beams, eye joists, and then structural composite lumber. Now here, where we have X, that's mean, and then we have standard deviation away from that mean, a value away from that mean. So what, this represents a load. So when a load is applied, we have a measure of property values, and wherever it lands when it's tested, we have a mean value. And then continually testing it, there may be results that are a standard deviation away from that mean or a result away from that mean. Now for something such as visually graded lumber, where we have a wider variation in the material, we're going to have a wider curve, so more distance away from that mean. Whereas for a structural co composite lumber that is highly engineered wood product, we're not going to have as much variability in that material. Now when we have a, when we take the mean over the standard deviation, we have something that's called a coefficient of variation. That's a value that we can utilize. Now if we mention, as I mentioned, this is load and this is the actual resistance. So for some reason, I'm going to take this out of, um, hold on a second. I lost my, okay, sorry about this. Okay, I got it back. I lost my um, sidebar. Okay, so we have a load, and then we have the resistance. And then if we take two of those, or one curve, and we still have the load on this side, and then we still have the resistance on this side, we would see that for all the load that we applied, we have a resistance side. Now here, where we overlap, that is an area where the load is greater than resistance. And this is where failure occurs, right here in that area. Now we can also take this even further and normalize those two curves. So we normalize those two curves and we subtract the resist, the applied load from the resistance load, which is shown here. From the resistance, we have the applied, which is shown in this performance distribution curve, um, and normalizing the two curves. And when we normalize those two curves, we can come up with a measurable way of probability of failure right here. So with these two curves, we have whatever is less than zero is where the 
structure or the member has failed. And this gives us a way of measuring the probability of failure. Now, also taking into account where we have M sub Z, which is the mean of performance distribution, and um, taking a ratio of that, we can come up with a safety index or a reliability index, which is beta right here. So now, how does that tie into what we do as designers? And I'll show you, so that's probability of failure where we have less than zero. Now the probability of failure is shown here. One failure, so probability of failure, so one failure expected for X number of structures design is represented in a given beta. So for example, we have a beta of 3.2 shown here. So for a beta of 3.2, we could it represents one failure for every thousand structures of members or members design. Carrying that even further, for any type of structure, this is typically what's done in industry, no matter what material, we have a beta of 2.6. That's typically what we design for. So for every one failure, or for every 63 structure design, it represents one failure, probability of failure. Now again, taking that even further, how did that does that tie into how we design our structures? Well, this beta is actually invisible in the actual design, but it's represented by the the alpha factor, which is here on the demand side, and then the fee factor on the capacity side. Now the fee factor is the demand side, so this is our load factor. This is what we see in our load combinations of our equations, whatever we have in ASCE 7. And then on the fee factor, the reliability index factor, this is material dependent. And this is how we actually calibrate uh, this calibrate what we use for calibrating our equations based on our material. So again, on the demand side, this is the different load equation or the different equations that we have in ASC7. And then the fee is dependent on the actual material that we're designing for and what type of loads we are resisting. So caliber, caliber, calibration covers the rele relevant factors. Um, so the load and the variability of the member strength, the species, type of application. Um, and generally for wood, we take the fifth percentile of strength design data and use this on the resistance side. Now lambda, which is here, that's the time effect factor, which replaces the load duration factor that we use in ASD design. So that's how it all ties into when we're designing with LRFD. <coughs> oh, oh no, okay. Sorry about that. I'm having all kinds of, I just went to the end. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Okay. So what stays the same? Well, for allowable stress design, we have same basic equations, same format, same adjustment factors, same behavioral equations when the, um, looking at uh, 2012 NDS. When we're looking at LRFD, however, we have three new quotations, which is the fee, the lambda, and the K factor, the conversion factor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we also have higher loads because they're factored in. And we also have, um, when we're looking at ASD and LRFD, we have unfactored loads for serviceability. That's the same. On the resistance side for LRFD, we have bigger uh, or material resistance values that are bigger. And then we have the load duration factor that changes to a time effect factor for LRFD. So I'll look at this. For ASD design, we have, again, looking at our demand side and our capacity side. For the demand for ASD side, the estimated loads are the design loads. There's no factors involved. And then on our capacity side, 
we have a high factor of safety because we're not very confident in the loads that are applied as far as as more as we are with LRFD. So we have a high factor of safety. Now comparing that to ASD though, now we have factored loads that account for variations in the loads. So our loads are higher because we're factoring those loads. But now on the resistance side, because we know more about the loads and the variations, now we have a higher, uh, fact, we have higher resistance also on this side. We don't have that high factor of safety that takes into account the capacity. Um, these are the loads in ASD or uh, on ASC 710, and the load combinations are pretty much the same for all materials. Um, they're factored loads for LRFD design. Now looking at all the how we design and utilize the NDS, when we take our reference design values for, from the supplement, the NDS supplement, um, these are reference design values that are based on allowable stress design. And I mentioned a conversion factor, which is case of F. Because this reference design values are based on ASD design, we need to convert them to an LRFD. Otherwise, we'd have to have two different re reference or supplements. So because of that, we want to have one supplement. We have a K factor. This is for LRFD that converts the ASD reference design values to an LRFD design. And again, we have a time effect factor, the lambda and which replaces the low duration factor, C sub D. And then we have the, re, the resistance factor, which is the fee factor that takes into account the type of loading and the material that's being used. So for ASD, we have the low duration factor. And for LRFD, we have a fee, that's the resistance factor. Lambda, which is the time effect factor, and K, which is the conversion factor. So why use LRFD? Well, it's ease of designing with multiple different materials. You can have both, if, for example, if you have a podium type project where you have a wood structure on top and you're applying that on top of a concrete podium, it allows you to use the same res results all the way down. Um, but it, and it doesn't penalize you for material strengths of unknowns on the load side of the equation. There's efficiencies in transient loads or extreme um, events, seismic loads or, or wind loads. And, um, but remember that um, you, you're still going to have to look at the serviceability uh, loads without using any of the load factors. Okay, so here's a poll, Suzanne. Okay, our next poll question is, the format conversion factor, K sub F, is only used with ASD. Is that true or false? I'll give you guys a few more seconds here. Oh, nope. No? Um, that's not the poll that I had. Oh, that was the next poll question that was loaded. Okay. Okay, we'll okay, go with I that. Go Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have about 70% voted so far. I'll close it in just a second. Let's see. Okay. So the response was 17% uh, said true and 83% said false. Okay. So back to you, Michelle. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Suzanne. And hopefully you're, are you seeing my slide? Okay, and this is the poll question I had. And the format conversion factor, you, most of you got it correct. It is used for LRFD. It converts ASD material reference design values from 2012 NDS supplement for use with LRFD. So great. 82% of you got, was it 82%? Most of you, the majority of you got it correct, and my slide is incorrect. Okay, now we'll get into now the NDS, probably what 
most of you are here for is this uh, going over the changes from the previous edition to the new edition. And I'll t throughout the presentation, the rest of the presentation, let's go. Oh, sorry. We have uh, icons in the bottom lower left-hand corner of the presentation, which shows an NDS 2005 and an NDS 2012. So this gives you a quick hint on what's the same for both 2005 and 2012, and then what's different. So if there's a change to the 2012, it'll only show the 2012 icon. So just a quick overview of the layout of the actual chapters for chapters one through three, this is where we get in the general requirements or the, the structural member property design values and the uh, property um, of the design provisions equations that apply to all the different framing members. And then from chapters four through nine, this is where we break it out to every different types of uh, wood framing members, sawn lumbers, glue lamb beams, round timber poles, prefabricated eye joists, that's where we break it out to those individual type chapters and framing members. And then we get into the connections, the mechanical connections all the way to timber rivets from 10 through 13. And then this we, we get into chapter 14 where we get into shear walls and diaphragms, special loading conditions, and then fire design of wood members in chapter 16. Now, also important is the commentary. We get a lot of questions regarding these chapters, and oftentimes, if you look in the commentary, that's where you'll find more information on that uh, to give you more in-depth information. Um, also, we have the supplement. This is where we get our reference design values, which covers sawn lumber, grading agencies that provide the grading for this lumber, species combinations, and then specific uh, section properties and covering all of these types of reference design values for these types of members, the lumbers and timbers, non-North American sawn lumber, glue lamb beams, MS, MSR and MEL type sawn lumbers, and then uh, timber poles and piles are in the reference. Uh, in, in the supplement. We also have appendices in the NDS, which gives you even more in-depth information. Um, please note that the appendices are not mandatory. You can utilize those to supplement your design. The only section that is mandatory is the Appendix N, and that just has to do with the LRFD design but all the other ones are supplemental information for your design, but some helpful information. Now into chapter one. This is where we go to for our general requirements for structural design, where we get our behavior, behavioral equations and uh, terminologies, actually. Um, when we look at our demand and capacity side of our equation, we have our demand. Um, the capacity we get from our reference design values, and those are adjusted with all the applicable adjustment factors. Previous to 2005, where we went to a dual format, but previous to that, we used to call them allowable design values, but now since we're doing dual format, now it's been adjusted to adjusted design values. And then we also reference in Chapter 1, we reference ASC 710. In the previous version, we were referencing ASC 75 to, um, based on the previous ASC 7 edition, um, but that's new to the 2012. Now on to Chapter 2, where we get into our design values for structural members. And this is where we get our adjustment factors that are applicable to all of the framing members. We incorporate the uh, table 2.3.6, which is the resistance factor. We talked about that previously. This was previously in the appendices. It's still in there, but we moved it to the body of the chapter so that you didn't have, won't have to search for it um, in the back of the volume. Now it's been moved. Um, and then, as you can see, we have the fee factors varying depending on what type of loads are being resistanced by the member. 
And then also we incorporated the um, adjustment factor for time, which has um, been adjusted and it's based on um, a baseline of 10 minutes, whereas the low duration factor for ASD design is based on a baseline of 10 years. Um, but you can see that we have the short term loading move this, uh, with a time factor, time effect factor of 1.0 all the way down to a permanent, uh, for permanent loading we have a 0.6 for the time effect factor. Okay. And then the conversion factor, which we talked about previously, having to do with converting the reference design values that are based on ASD to an LRFD design. Um, and that's been moved from the appendices into Chapter 2. And um, there was one slight change, which was revised for the compression perpendicular to grain. It was revised to be in line with ASTM D5457. Um, the applicable factor to allowable stress design is the low duration factor, and that's based on the frequency of the loads that are applied. And again, this is based on a baseline of 10 years that's um, been used. And then also in Chapter 2, we have a temperature uh, factor, which is an adjustment factor for those cases where the wood member is exposed to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And this has to do with those cases where it's exposed to greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit for a sustained period of time. So we often get uh, questions regarding, okay, well, what if we have framing members in an attic where it gets really hot? Um, and uh, But those cases, it's not for a sustained period of time, and that's the key. Is it exposed for a sustained, sustained period of time? When we're in an attic, that actually has a chance to, it heats up during the day and then it cools off during the day. So uh, this is a diurnal effect where, again, hot during the day possibly and cooling off in the evening that would not be a sustained period, sustained period of time. And when we're talking about a sustained period of time, maybe you're in an industrial setting or where you are in a cooling tower with, where you're at elevated temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Those are the cases where you're going to utilize the temperature factor. Another temperature, another adjustment factor that we need to be aware of is the West Service factor, uh, C sub N. And this is where we're exposed to a wet environment greater than 19% moisture content for a sustained period or a prolonged period of time. So if you're, for example, you've got a patio and it's covered and it's not exposed to moisture for a sustained period of time, it would not apply there. However, if you're in an environment where it's continually wetting for a sustained period of time, then it would apply there. Now this graph uh, shows that wood can get above 19% moisture content if the relative humidity is about mid-80s for an extended period. So for example, on the horizontal axis we have relative humidity and on the vertical axis we have moisture content or equilibrium moisture content. Uh, the various graph that shows different colors. The yellow would be for temperatures of 130 degree Fahrenheit and the pink would be 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the black is 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But you can see when it gets over 80 degrees relative moisture, con relative humidity, the moisture content can be uh, really affected and gets above 19 percent moisture content. So something to be aware of. All the reference design values and the NDS is based on the wood being at uh, less than or equal to 19 percent moisture content. So if you're in an environment, this is knowing what the end use of that structural material or structural framing member is going to be exposed to. Understanding that is important and incorporating this moisture wet service 
factor into your design. Um, this shows a graph of what can happen given the various uh, looking at it from the different moisture content. So starting off, we got moisture content on the horizontal axis. We're starting off at 12% moisture content, and then strength percentage at 12% moisture content. So we're at 100% strength. As the moisture content increases, you can see for impact strength, um, it actually adds to the impact strength, uh, as to the strength, but for modulus of elasticity, the strength gets redu redu reduced. The modulus of elasticity gets reduced as the moisture content increases. And then for modulus of rupture, also the moisture content, as it increases, we get a decrease in the modulus of rupture. And in particular, the crushing strength also decreases as the moisture content increases. So very, um, we need to understand where we are with our moisture content, what is the end use of that framing member, and incorporate this into our design. Um, so this also shows the table from the NDS and shows the overall wet surface moisture content. And as you can see, we showed in the previous slide the crushing strength drastically gets reduced as the moisture content of the wood increases, and it's reflected in these wet service factors. So that takes the biggest hit. We are at about a 33% reduction in our compression perpendicular grade if we exceed our moisture content of 90%. Um, similarly, for our compression, it doesn't affect the tension parallel to grain very much, and um, so incorporating that. Now, another poll that we have for our audience. Okay, the temperature factor C sub T applies to conditions where the wood temperatures exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit for sustained periods of time, 100 degrees Fahrenheit for short periods of time, 100 degrees Fahrenheit at any time, or 100 degrees Celsius at any time. And we've got about 35% of people have voted so far. And I can see that people are headed in the right direction. Okay, I'm going to close this up in just a second. Okay, so you can see that 90% of the people selected the correct answer, which was 100 degrees Fahrenheit for sustained periods of time. Okay, Michelle? Okay, I don't think they're seeing the slide. Okay, great. Thank you, Suzanne. And the answer is 100 degrees Fahrenheit for sustained periods of time. All right. Okay, so now, um, as I mentioned, um, that is correct. 100 degrees for a sustained period of time is what we are out. So chapter three, now we're on to the design provisions and equations. And this is where we get our behavior equations, depending on what type of loads are being applied and our resistance to those loads. Now the ASD versus LRFD, we're going to adjust our resistance side of the equation for ASD times our load duration factor and whatever applicable adjustment factors are applied depending on the type of loads that we're resisting or how we're resisting it. And then the LRFD, uh, the capacity side, is we've got a conversion factor, a fee factor, and a time effect factor. And those all have the same adjustment factor. So next we have our behavior equation for our beams. And as you can see that um, Again, these are the icons that show that nothing's changed between ASD uh, or from the 2005 NDS to the 2012. When we look at our behavioral equations, we look at our beam stability. And the beam stability equation incorporates a critical buckling design uh, value for bending, which has been restructured 
because uh, based on changing from a dual from a allowable stress design to a dual format design in our equations. And this E sub met E prime min was introduced to incorporate the same design equation for the same types of uh, methods of design. Now in 2005, it changed from this 2001 equation under the NDS. This K factor was based on a reduction factor for allowable stress design. If you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, this K factor included a reduction for allowable stress design. So because of that, and we wanted to have the dual format in our equation, we changed the equation to include a E minimum, which takes into adjust for both ASD and LRFD processes. And similarly, for column design, we used to have a K factor that uh, was based on allowable stress design and to incorporate uh, both ASD and LRFD design in the equation, we came up with an E minimum. The E minimum represents the approximate 5% uh, lower exclusion value and the E minimum can be easily, uh, you can easily obtain that from the tables within the NDS supplement or if you really want to find, sharpen your pencil and get the exact value of the E minimum, there's also an equation that will allow you to actually calculate the E minimum, but you want the quick reference, you can go to the NDS supplement. Another behavioral equation that we look at is our tension members parallel to grain and similarly we have the low duration factor for allowable stress design and the LRFD factors for LRFD design. But the adju adjustment factors is the same for both ASD and LRFD design. Now one thing we want to consider when we're designing our members is wood and how it's resisting the loads. What we want to try to avoid is our tension perpendicular to grain because that's the Achilles heels of wood members. Um, this is uh, the initiators of this tension perpendicular to grain or notches, moment connections or hanging loads where you're or even closely spaced nails that uh, will apply a load perpendicular to grain. So it's not recommended um, and you should see NDS 3.8.2 point two for some more information regarding that, but uh, we want to avoid this at all um, at, as all possible. Um, when we look at our framing member and it's re resisting both combined bending and axial load, uh, we will need to check it based on this combined axial bending and axial compression equation. What you will see is this uh, very this illustration, and some of you may have caught it all um, right off the bat if you're paying attention. There is something wrong with this illustration, and for those of you, maybe you caught it, but actually the il illustration was incorrect, and it's because we're actually talking about compression and not tension. So for those of you, kudos that you caught this. Um, we've changed the slide to add these arrows to um, show that it is compression. But this three-part equation shows the first part. The first part of the equation checks the short column action. Um, and then the last two parts of the equation checks for the bending portion of the equation we're doing by axial bending and axial compression. And um, we have the moment magnification in the denominator. Well, what we found is in the denominator, this third term equation, in the denominator, which checks flatwise bending, there is a possibility for this to go to a negative number. And if you're just automatically adding these three terms and not checking this third term individually, it could come up with some neg um, false results. So be because of that, in 2012, we've added this new equation so it'll check that flatwise bending. Um, so again, this third term introduced to check that flatwise bending because of that possible negative in the equation.
Now we have also we check the varying perpendicular to the grain, um, and this has to do with if we're dealing with a load that's applied, um, for example, if you have a stud that's bearing on a sill plate and you're doing multi-story construction, you want to check, make sure and check that you're not crushing that framing uh, the sill plate beyond its capacity. You can see that there are some advantages from having a um, shorter member to resist that bearing perpendicular to grain. They found through testing that shorter members are, have the ability to resist that perpendicular uh, to grain bearing more readily than if you have a long member. So you see some uh, increase in your capacity because of that testing that was done. Now we're on to chapter four. Now we're getting into the individual chapters that deal with the actual framing members. And for the chapter four, this is, covers the sawn lumber, which covers the uh, visually graded lumber, the machine stress rated lumber, and the machine evaluated lumber, as well as decking and timber is covered in the lumber section. And for the adjustment factors, I know I've been talking about this throughout the presentation, but um, for lumber, as you can see, we have the equations for bearing or for bending, tension, shear, perpendicular grain compression, compression, and the uh, modulus of elasticity. So we can utilize this handy table, which for allowable stress design, this low duration factor only applies to allowable stress design. And then all of these applicable factors apply to allowable stress design. On the right side of the table, we have LRFD uh, factors that apply only to LRFD, and then all of the adjustment factors that are in the white apply to LRFD. So easy way to let you know what factors apply to what. Now this table actually shows the uh, table that was for 2005 NDS. Well, what we've done is we've improved upon the table and we've actually included the actual factors for LRFD design. Previous to this, you'd have to go to the appendix to see what the actual format conversion factor is or the resistance factor is. Now we've incorporated those factors in this table under the 2012 NDS. When we're dealing with lumber also, depending on the size of your framing member that you're designing for lumber, there is an adjustment factor for the, si for the size of the member. As you can see, you can see some added benefits of using uh, less depth in your framing member. Um, you get an increase of 50% for your bending when you're dealing with bending or tension or compression of your framing member. So the size factor comes into play. And then there's an adjustment factor depending on uh, if it's incised or not. We find that um, this factor if you're dealing with a refractory type species, meaning like a Douglas fir, where if a treatment is applied to that, um, say a preservative treatment, and in order for that preservative treatment to penetrate and get well within the framing member, it needs to be in size so that treatment can penetrate this. So an incising factor will come into play, which um, we find that that incising can weaken the framing member, and that's, that's why there's a reduction in the value um, for modulus of elasticity or bending or tension or compression or shear. Um, some southern pine values are, are not affected typically by this because they are very absorbent to those type of materials but it will probably or will apply to Douglas fir if they are incising it to absorb that treatment. Now um, also you will see some uh, benefits if you have a system of framing members. For example, if you're dealing with studs in a wall and um, this is called a adjustment factor for repetitive framing members. Some people, well, what does it qual what qualifies it as a repetitive framing member? And the key is, is that it's a system. Uh, and the spacing of the framing members is less than 24 inches uh, on center. You have three or more framing members. And the load is distributed uh, amongst the elements. So a good example, as I mentioned, is a stead wall where you would have the load duration factor or I'm sorry, the repetitive member factor involved 
1.15, getting a 15% increase in your capacity. Now on to Chapter 5. This is where we deal with our structural glue laminated timbers and dedicated to that framing member. Um, there are some significant changes related, or the significant changes actually that are related to glue lamb beam has to do with our um, stress interaction and our shear reduction um, dealing with those. And um, before I go into explaining those two, there is also some clarifications within the actual body of Chapter 5 dealing with curved members or double tapered members and tapered straight members, um, clarification of the language for uh, showing what uh, provisions apply to what type of framing members. But um, we talked about the new adjustment factors and um, when we're talking about this year interaction um, or the stress interaction and um, where does that apply? We would see that it applies to the bending when we're dealing with bending and for those members that are tapered. So for tapered members, um, this actually in the previous edition of the 2005 we had a note that stated to see the timber construction manual for uh, members that are tapered. However, now we brought it into the body of the NDS and it's um, in this table for stress interaction factor for bending. That's incorporated. Um, also, for shear reduction, this actually used to be in the footnote of the supplement, but now we brought that into the body of the Chapter 5 so it's more um, visible that it won't be overlooked, and it deals with shear for, uh, when we're looking the checking the shear resistance of our member. Um, it applies to those members that are non-prismatic or if you're such as uh, notched members, curved members, tapered members, or um, and you're dealing with designing of your actual connection where you're not going to have a prismatic member, this factor will come into play. And it can really, it could really affect the actual uh, connection design by quite a bit. So keeping that in mind when we're dealing with the design of our mem connections and we're looking at our shear equations. Um, just to clarify, well, I talked about clarifying the language within Chapter 5. Um, this is an example of what curved members look like or tapered members or um, tapered straight members look like when we're dealing with it. So if you're just dealing with a um, uniform straight rectangular member, then the clarification language would not apply to those members. It just um, if you're dealing with these other members, they would apply. But definitely the adjustment factors would apply. Okay. And then another adjustment factor to consider is the volume factor. And this has to do with the actual depth of the member. Um, the volume factor deals with, um, for those members that are greater than 12 inches in depth, this would apply. And um, the thing to be aware of is there's also a beam stability factor, which we talked about previously. But what you need to be aware of is that it's not cumulative the volume factor is not cumulative with the beam stability factor. So when we're designing our glue lamb beams, we don't take, we, it's not combining the two factors, you take the minimum of the two factors when doing our design. Okay, so I believe we have a poll question coming up. We do. It's the two new adjustment factors added to the glued laminated timber design are stress interaction and shear reduction factors. Please select one, true or false. The votes are starting to come in. Heavily weighted in one direction, so we'll see if that's correct. Okay, I'm going to give it about five more seconds. Okay, we have about 70 some percent, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. And 
our results were 91% true and 9% false. Michelle? All right. That's great. That's good. Re oh, what happened? Oops. Well, the true zoomed up. Okay. Are you seeing the true? Well, the true's not showing up online, but uh, true. It's true. <laughs> so, <Okay>. yes, true. <laughs> The two new adjustment factors were added to glue, laminated, timber designs are stress interaction and shear reduction factor. Okay, now we're going on to chapter six. And this is a chapter that's been expanded in uh, under the 2012 NDS. Um, we're probably seeing more and more types of structures. Um, this is round timber poles and piles. Um, just a trivia question, who can tell me, well I guess you can't answer, but the difference between a pole and a pile. And um, poles are post, can, will cover post frame structures and piles are foundations. That's a hint of what the pole and piles are. But a pile, now when we get the poles or the round timbers, they are typically narrow at one end and larger at the other end. Well, a pile are those that have the narrow end going into the, the soil that we're um, supporting the structure on. And then poles are those that have the wide end on the bottom and we support the structure on the narrow end. So that's a basic overall difference. And I've heard that when I've given the presentation throughout the nation, similar ideas on what pole and pile are. But piles are used for foundation and the poles are used for the post frame construction. And uh, we've had some uh, changes in the design values or the reference design values in the 2005. In the 2012 you will see uh, an increase in most of your reference design values. And also um, they were within the, in the 2005 they were within the body of chapter 6 but we've migrated those to the supplement to be in line with what other framing materials that the reference design values are in the supplement. And uh, also, this is similarly true for, that was uh, timber piles and now timber poles. Similarly, that the reference design values were in Chapter 6 and we've migrated them to the supplement. And you can see an increase in uh, most of the values also. Um, and these new design values have been reviewed by the responsible parties um, and, and have been incorporated in the uh, supplement, as I mentioned. Also, some adjustment factors come into play when we're designing our poles and piles. Um, there was a slight change in this table 6.3.5 in that it used to be titled unconditioned uh, treatment. The treatment factor would apply, but um, to be in line with industry that, that all poles are supposed are conditioned. Um, in fact, that incorporates air dried condition. So this has been adjusted to uh, reflect what's actually in the industry. There are no unconditioned um, poles or piles. And then also uh, for the critical section factor, we have a C sub S, which incorporates this load sharing factor. Um, it's been updated to reflect also how industry designs and that is that it's not based on a single pile, it's actually based on a group action or a sharing of the load amongst the piles. So that's been incorporated in the table. Now on to chapter 7 which in deals with the prefabricated wood eye joists. Now as many of you know these are proprietary type members where the reference design values, you'll have to see the manufacturer of these framing members, the eye joists, uh, but it applies to prefabricated eye joists that are conforming to ASTM D5055. There are no changes made to this section for um, Chapter 7 the, as far as the design values uh, or the applicable adjustment factors except for when we look at the stability and we're checking the bending of the framing members. This is similar to what you would see in other type of framing members in that 
if, if you're dealing with, uh, say, a simply supported member and the top of that framing member is laterally supported or laterally raised by a diaphragm, um, we now have a compression um, uh, beam stability factor of 1.0. And that's similar to other framing factors. If it's the compression portion of the flange is um, simply supported and you have compression top of the uh, member braced by the diaphragm, then you have a 1.0. For those that are unbraced, you'll have to design it as an unbraced column to analyze that member. On to Chapter 8, this is also uh, an uh, engineered wood product, uh, structural composite lumber. And similar to iJoyce, that's an engineered product, a proprietary product, you'll have to see the evaluation reports and the manufacturers to get those reference design values. Um, the one thing I want to point out is we started off with LRFD and an explanation. Well, this just shows um, when we're talking about variability in our framing members, um, the structural composite lumber is one of those highly engineered wood framing members that um, the variability from the mean is, is um, less uh, because of it, it's, it is a highly engineered wood product. And for structural composite lumbers, the, the one thing I want to point out is there is a volume factor similarly to Gulam beams. However, the volume factor is not cumulative. Uh, if your C sub V is less than one, less than or equal to one, then it's not cumulative with a beam stability factor. However, and that's similar to glue line beams, however, if it's greater than one, then it is cumulative. So this is key when we're looking at our structural composite lumber and we're checking the flexure of the framing member. Um, it can be cumulative, unlike glue line beams. So again, be aware of that. Um, also, structural composite lumber, if we're dealing with repetitive framing members, that means we have uh, members that are less than 24 inches on center, and uh, we have a system, it does, uh, a repetitive member factor does apply. However, unlike sawn lumber, which has a 1.15 increase, there is a 1.4 1.04 increase. So you get a 4% increase in your capacity of that framing members. And it only applies to F sub E. So when you get those design values from the manufacturer, you might want to check to see if they've already incorporated this into their design values or they probably have something in the footnote that will tell you whether or not you can apply this increase in 4% because of the repetitive framing member. And you might also check also with the tables to see about, to check that cumulative effect of the volume factor also with the manufacturer. Now on to chapter nine, we cover our wood structural panels and the design values are uh, attained from an approval so, approved source um, for the bending, all of the aspects of um, how it's resisting those loads. You want to attain the design values from approved source. And there were some adjustment factors, um, more specifically for the C sub G. Under the 2005, there was a C sub G grade and construction fa factor that was in 2005 that is no longer used because uh, industry, the wood structural panel industry does not use this factor, it's already taken into account. So it's been removed in the 2012 NDS. And there's a clarification of when the panel size factor is uh, used. Um, it used to be the commentary on this or the explanation of when the panel size factor was in the commentary and now it's brought within chapter nine so it's more prevalent and you can see when this factor is actually applied. So if you're using panels that are less than 24 inches on center, I mean are less than 24 inches in width, then the panel size factor does not come into play. However, if you have widths that are less than 24 inches, then the panel size factor would come into play. So for those, we know that um, panel, all the walls and the uh, 
floors and wherever your wood structural panels don't always add up to 8 by 4 panels. So you might want to check if you're resisting the load, loads and, and you have panels that are less than that, 24 inches width. Now, wood structural panels also, if they're exposed to a wet environment or wet service environment, then that would come into play, wet service factor would come into play, and it would affect the strength and stiffness of the framing members for those exposed members. Similarly for, and again, we're dealing with sustained exposures to wet, uh, wet service, the, wet environment or uh, sustained temperatures greater than 100 degrees, then these factors would come into play related to um, checking those framing members. <clears throat> now we're on to mechanical uh, connectors. So you, we've gone through all the framing members and now we're into chapter 10 on our actual connections, and um, you'll notice a change in the 2015 NDS, which I'll mention at the end of the presentation. Um, we will have a Chapter 10 on cross-laminated timber that we'll um, see in the 2015. Right now we're in Chapter 10, we're getting into mechanical connectors, and the mechanical connections include all of these type of framing members. We have dowel type connections that are covered in Chapter 11 split rings in chapter 12 and shear plates in chapter 12 and then timber rivets that are in chapter 13 but um, chapter 10 covers all the mechanical connectors and uh, the adjustment factors um, there's no real significant changes that have occurred in chapter 10 uh, but when we move into chapter 11 this is when we get into the specific types of connections related to dowels Excuse me. So, for example, we're looking at bolts, lag screws, wood screws, nails, spikes, the common type of uh, connection fasteners that we would use. Um, you'll notice a minor change in uh, the actual titles and footnotes of the actual tables that are used for, for example, lag screws where we've got a clarification, the top one shows 2005 NDS and the bottom one shows the 2012. Well, we've clarified the actual um, relationship related to the thread penetration when we're looking at uh, lag screw and um, what's the assumptions that are used when creating these tables. Previously, we used to say go to Appendix L to see the assumptions that were used for the length thread Pen, the length of the uh, thread penetration. Well, now they, we've brought that into Chapter 11, so it's more clear, it's more handy. You can look within the uh, Chapter 11 to get information related to the assumptions on the thread penetration. And you can see the table title is reflected that to see Section 11.2.1.1 instead of going to the appendix. Um, and also, um, there's been a change in the, uh, when we're looking at utilizing the yield equations, the sick yield equations for the dowel connections, and I'll, it, it's better if I go to the next section, but um, this is the actual language that occurs, and what it states is for the dowels, when using the tables for the fasteners, um, where used in tables 11.3.1.a or the other table, the fastener diameter shall be taken as D for unthreaded full body diameter fasteners and D sub R for reduced body diameter fasteners or threaded fasteners except as provided down below. Now the reason why I point this out is, is that what happens is, and this is where a picture is worth a thousand words, is we have different types of fasteners and different types of fasteners. When we're looking at, for example, a dowel type fastener, a full body diameter fastener is shown here in the top, where you have a certain diameter, D, which is full body here, and then when it's threaded, we have a reduced body diameter fastener. So, for example, here's a full body diameter, and this is a reduced, where the, re the root is um, diameter is less than 
the D diameter. Now for a hex lag screw, we have below, oops, sorry, um, here we see a diameter which is a reduce, reduced body diameter. So the diameter is actually the same all the way through the full body of the lag screw. So D sub R equals D. For a full body diameter, we have full body, again, the one on the right, and then it's reduced because of the threading process. Well, the language in the uh, NDS has been clarified to reflect this because, as you can imagine, depending on where the shear plane occurs is going to depend on which actual diameter that we use. And since there's an unknown there, do we know where the threads are going to stop and where they're going to begin? We've uh, clarified this and stated that the D sub R, uh, or D, for our yield equations will equal D sub R if our thread is less than L over uh, L the main body over 4. So this depth, our thread, is guaranteed to be less than L over 4, then we can use D as our part um, in our equation for our yield equation. Similarly with the illustration below. However, if we're not certain of this and we're not sure where it's going to occur, then we're going to have to use D sub R for our yield equations. So that's a clarification because we're uh, not sure of where um, it's going to occur. Now, if you would like to sharpen your pencil and you want to make sure that you get the full capacity of that uh, connection, say you're dealing with an existing condition and you know where those threads are occurred, you can actually calculate the capacity based on whatever D you're assuming and utilizing this uh, technical report 12, which is general Dowell equations for calculating lateral connection values. This is a really handy document. It's freely downloaded from our website, so you can dial in your equation or your calculations in your design utilizing this document. But if you don't do this, you'll have to use the D sub R for your equation, unless you meet that requirement of L over 4 on the uh, depth of the threaded member. Now, the other advantage of this T sub R is it if you've looked at the six yield equations, you know that there is a nonlinear equation. It's a pretty, for lack of a better term, really hairy equation. And um, if you go to the uh, TR12, though, you'll see that there's been a uh, cleaning up of the equation. It's uh, mathematically the same. You have a quadratic equation rather than this big hairy equation that's in NDS. Um, so you can utilize this TR12 for your yield equations, and it, it simplifies your, uh, your design as far as calculating the capacity of your connection because there's less room for error because of the quadratic e equation. And they're mathematically the same. It just um, simplifies those equations. Also, you'll note in NDS, uh, those equations in the NDS do not allow for any gaps between your wood framing members. However, if you go to TR12, you're allowed to have gaps within those members. Um, also, you can um, included in TR12 are various fastener moment resisting configurations that can be calculating the capacity. New to also TR12 is the ability to now design for a hollow members. For example, if you have a steel tube and you want to connect that to a wood member, that is new to the TR12. Also, there's been a verification. I know Lori Koch, if you're listening, she did numerous, numerous research or uh, calculations based on the tapered tips assumptions that are utilized for lag screws and, and um, that's included. Um, you can actually calculate your capacities or verification of the capacities within TR12 for those fasteners. So that's a very handy document to go to. There's um, also for in chapter 
11, I know we were talking about DELs and um, the yield equations new to Chapter 11 are tabulated values for new for uh, post ring post frame ring shank nails, which um, is based on ASTM F161 or 667, and in, it uh, takes into account um, the withdrawal values design equations is based on research conducted by the Forest Products Lab, um, including a 20% adjustment to account for the effects of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, galvanized coating, because we know that galvanized coating um, really adds some capacity to the withdrawal of those, uh, those ring shank nails. So that's incorporated into these tables. Um, and it, I mentioned also about uh, the tips of uh, ter certain types of fasteners. We have screws, wo wood screws, lag screws, nails and spikes. Now there's been a clarification or provisions were added to clarify how the tip length is addressed uh, and determining the actual bearing length used for the lateral load calculation. So that's been incorporated into the NTS. <clears throat> Um, there has been a clarification of when we're dealing with dowel bearing for wood structural panels. Some of you may have um, calculated what the capacity is for perhaps a lag screw or um, a wood screw um, for wood structural panels. Well, this is a clarification in that this table that's table 11.3.3.3b only applies to those types of fasteners that are less than or equal to a quarter of an inch. Um, if you have something greater than that, um, I um, suggest seeing APA. I believe they have some bearing capacities for those types of members that um, are resisting loads for fasteners that are greater than a quarter of an inch. But um, clarification that shows that that is only for um, less than a quarter of an inch. Also, there's been a table now that's a new table that incorporates the distance between outer rows. If you can see on um, figure 11F, when we're talking about wood framing the members, um, and if it, it's um, a natural member that will acclimate when it comes out to the job site, so there may be a tendency to shrink in depth. Because of that require, or because of the um, this mode of shrinking, there is a maximum distance between your outer rows of bolts because to prevent splitting and reduction in your capacity of your connection. So the, the for typical framing members, wood members, the uh, distance is five inches. But because of glue lamb beams being designed uh, our engineered wood products and manufacturing really dry, they have a less of a tendency to shrink at, with bolts in specifically. Um, you can see for this example for, let me go here, um, moisture content that are less than at the time of fabrication, which they typically are fabricated less than 16% moisture content, and in service, that's the key, if it's in service, then you can increase that 5 inches uh, up to 10 inches um, for your distance between rows. And again, it has to do with the moisture content of the actual wood framing members. Now, these two figures in the table that I'm showing is applies where you don't have the ability for those bolts to move vertically. So, for example, if you provide a connection and there is a way, a method for those uh, bolts to, for example, a slotted member to allow for that member to um, move vertically, then the 5 inches or the 10 inches don't apply because you're not going to have that resistance if it was held in place without any way for that bolt to move. So something to keep in mind. Okay, now we have one more poll question. We do, and I hope everybody was paying attention when Michelle was talking about TR12. That's our next poll question. TR12 includes general dowel equations and provides tools for the analysis of gas between members, fasteners through hollow members, fasteners with tapered tips, all of the above or none of the above. 
go ahead and select what you think the best answer is. And we're at about 60%. I'll give it a few more seconds before I close the poll. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that. And you can see that we had 4% of the people said gaps between members, 3% fasteners through hollow members, 7% fasteners with paper tips. The vast majority said all of the above, and then we had 8% that said none of the above. So Michelle, I will let you give the correct answer to that question. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. And yes, uh, so repeating the question, TR12 includes general Dow equations and provides tools for the analysis of, yes, gap between members, fasteners through hollow members, fasteners with tapered tips, and all of the above, or none of the above. Well, hopefully it's none of the above, but the right answer is, oops, all of the above. So, yes, it includes gaps, um, which NDS does not include, uh, does not provide provisions for those members if you have a gap between them. So you'll have to go to TR12. It also new to TR12 for this year, um, this is actually published this year, are those for fasteners with hollow members, such as steel tubes, and then also fasteners with tapered tips, um, the lag screws, the nails, the uh, uh, wood screws also. So for those of you who answered all OBIV, all right, you got it correct. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Okay, now on to Chapter 12. Um, chapter 12 is uh, covers split rings and shear plate connectors. Um, this is kind of a niche type uh, connector. I know there are some that specialize in these type of connections, some engineers that specialize in these type of connections. One thing to be aware of is if you're dealing with heavy timber type structures, these provide, and large framing members, these provide a great amount of capacity for your connection. This is something to be familiar with. Um, there has been, uh, the title has been revised for this table 12.3.2.2 to clarify the applicability of the provisions in these connections for side grain and the provisions uh, for edge grain or edge distance and edge distance and spacing were relocated into the section. Um, to clarify what applies, um, just a clarification of the section to show what factors apply to what situation. Um, and this one actually applies to side grain, this table. Also, for the geometry factor, C sub D, or actually it should be C sub delta, I believe. So that should be a, not a D, but a delta on this um, bullet point. And um, it should be C sub delta, which applies to factors for determining the minimum loaded edge distance and connections on edge grain. So clarification new tables um, were added to clarify the applicability of the requirements of the connection when installed in end grain. So new tables. On to chapter 13. Now these uh, this covers timber rivets that can provide pretty um, some really elegant type connectors. Um, they're rivets that are oval shaped and um, they're uh, fastened into certain types of configurations. Um, there are provisions in the NDS that are for uh, steel plates for southern pine or western species of glue laminated beans and again just for glue laminate beans and um, also incorporated there has been a slight change from the NDS 2005 to the 2012 having to do with the timber rivet capacity. The equations were incorporated to, um, were revised to incorporate the application of the load duration factor parallel to grain and perpendicular to grain. And um, I'll give you a little bit of background here. For the applicable 
factors under the 2005 for timber rivets. What it says for this column for ASD uh, design only, there's a load duration factor. And footnote 4 states, the load duration factor, C sub D, is a, only applied when wood capacity controls. So perpendicular or parallel to grain when wood capacity controls. Well, that kind of added some confusion because some people were wondering, well, what controls, the wood or the steel? What really controls? So in order to eliminate that confusion and to clarify it within the um, actual capacities of the timber rivets, we've incorporated it into the actual equations that are applied. You can still see we still have the low duration factor for timber rivets, but that now just applies whether or not you don't have to determine whether or not um, it controls. So here's the old equation, well, the previous equation in the 2005, which was 280 uh, times the P N and N, and then um, also for perpendicular grain, and we've reduced it to incorporate that low duration factor, so you don't have to determine uh, it's already in, in incorporated. <clears throat> And um, also, to be consistent with glue lamb beams, the maximum distance perpendicular to grain between rolls is 12 inches. Um, again, because it's a glue lamb beam, it's a high uh, manufactured, relatively dry relative to the other building materials. So the outermost rows are increased to 12 inches because of that, uh, the manufacturing of that member. <clears throat> now on to chapter 14 excuse me, where we're dealing with shear walls and diaphragms. Um, no big change there. Um, it's just a one-line equation that uh, refers the user to the, um, when we're looking at shear walls and diaphragms, you refer to the special provisions for wind and seismic document. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, uh, it's a 2008 document and it's a free download from our website. You go to our awc.org. It is a read-only version though and um, that's available. And I think we have the link. Here it goes. Um, uh, a, it's uh, ANSI AWC Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic. Um, and for those of you that would like additional information, we do have recorded webinars on the, the changes from the 2005 to the 2008, and um, also there's also really good in-depth look at diaphragm deflection webinar that you can watch for free on, from our website. And I believe the diaphragm deflection uh, webinar, you can also get continuing education, um, I, ICC uh, and NCSCA equation if you watch the video and then you've got to take a quiz, of course. So some um, self-directed learning that's available, which is relatively new to our education resources that's available to you. And those are for free. Okay, on to Chapter 15. This is where we get into the special load conditions related to load distribution of concentrated loads, um, space columns, built-up columns, and wood columns with side loads or eccentric loading. Um, the only minor change that occurred there, similar to what we saw in the earlier part of the presentation where we're checking flat rise bending, there's a new equation that checks uh, the intermediate calculations for members subject to flatwise bending in combination with compression or without edgewise bending so that you're not getting false results because of it, the possibility of that lower uh, portion of the equation going to negative. So that's a new equation. Now on to chapter 16. Many of you, well, some of you may not be familiar with Chapter 16, and this is a really handy chapter when we want to uh, calculate the fire resistance of wood framing members. So if you have an architect that wants to see the exposed glue lamb beam column or beam or other type of framing member, um, uh, this is something that is a, a provision that is adopted in IBC uh, 2012. It's calculating fire resistance. It's in section 722. You can calculate up to two hours of fire resistance. So 
which is stated here the on the last sentence of this paragraph, um, the calculated fire resistance of exposed wood members and wood decking shall be permitted in accordance with Chapter 16 of the ANSI AFMPA National Design Specifications for Wood Construction. And um, as I was starting this data, if you have an architect that wants to see that exposed glue lamb beam or exposed lumber and um, they need a certain fire resistance, this is where it takes you communicating with the architect, working as a team member, and coming up with a way, a method of calculating the fire resistance. You can calculate up to two hours of fire resistance in Chapter 16. And um, this covers columns, beam, tension members. This is only for allowable stress design. And the wood products that are incorporated in Chapter 16 are lumbers, glue lamb beam, structural com composite lumber, and decking, all in that Chapter 16. And the whole philosophy, uh, theory behind this, and this has been tested as well, is that um, fire resistance of wood, we know wood burns, yes it burns, uh, but after a certain amount of time, a charring action will occur, which you will see here, and it will protect the wood framing member from burning further, so it's an insulator against burning further. And we take that further. This is an example of a glue lamb beam and a steel beam, which is unprotected. So it's like similar to type 2B construction, where you have steel beam unprotected, and then a heavy timber construction, where you have a glue lamb beam, or a one-hour rated construction, whatever the case may be. The glue lamb beam and the steel beam are the same strength. You have strength on the vertical axis, and then on the horizontal axis, we have time. At zero time, when the test was started, both framing members were the same strength. After we exposed to wood for 30 minutes, you would see that the wood framing member only lost 25% of its strength because of the fire, when it's exposed to fire, it doesn't burn any further and reduce the strength of the framing member. However, in this testing, uh, for the steel member that was exposed steel member, after 30 minutes it lost 90% of its strength. Um, and you can get a copy of this actual test report on uh, the AITC website. It's available to re read if you're so interested in doing so. And that, um, that's one of the reasons why there is this calculated method because of that re uh, natural ability of the wood mem framing member to uh, resist fire. Now, beyond Chapter 16, there is also a technical report, 10, which is a free download from the American Wood Council website, but it contains full details of the NDS method as well as design examples. It also includes sections, new sections that support um, design methods such as um, with smaller dimensional size lumbers that aren't included in the Chapter 16 of the NDS. So this is a really good document, especially because of the design examples that are provided. And if you're interested in finding out more information, we have an article that was authored by our uh, AD, AWC that's in the Structure Magazine that um, talks about code update design of fire exposed wood members. Um, you can download from this from the AWC website that gives you more information on the background behind the NDS as well as TR10 uh, related to exposure of wood members. Now we have one more poll. I think this may be the last poll. <laughs> it is. You are right. Okay. This one is, the IBC includes provisions for calculating fire resistance of exposed wood members and wood decking for up to two hours. So everybody should get this right. It is heavily weighed in one direction, so I do think everybody knows the right answer. <laughs> Okay, we're up to about 65%. I'll give it a few more seconds before closing that poll. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see, I will share the results of that. And you can see that we had 87% of people um, answer true and 13% answer false. Okay. If you guys were watching, oh, I wasn't exposed. Okay, now you see the results. And the answer is, the IVC includes provisions for calculating fire resistance of exposed wood members and wood decking for up to two hours. And that is very true. And um, it's mentioned in chapter or section 722 of the IBC. I know this is a section that is not always read, um, mostly read by the architectural or, um, industry, but um, chapter 722 will give you some further information, or section 2722 will give you further referencing to the NDS chapter 16. Okay. Now we're on to the appendices, and as I mentioned, this is all, um, the only section in the appendices that is mandatory is section N, but this provides you with a lot of helpful information, useful information in your um, designing to give you supplemental information in the designing of your wood framing members in your wood structures. This gives you an overview uh, for A, B, uh, section A gives you construction and design practices, gives you more background on load duration factor, temperature effects. So if you're looking for, okay, well, what was she talking about regarding temperature effects? Well, this is a good section to go to as well as the commentary to go to to get more information. So all of that, um, even solutions of Hankinson's equations, remember that from Back in the college days of Hankinson's formula, where you have the load applied at different angles to that connection, effects of column length, stability, and um, also uh, manufacturing tolerances for rivets um, and, and steel plates. And I mentioned timber rivets, and I should have mentioned this back when I was talking about it, but on our website, we have an FAQ, which I should have mentioned previously, um, we have a lot of FAQ questions related to a lot of questions, obviously, that come into play that are frequently asked. One question is, where are timber rivets available? So if you're interested, you can go to our website, just type in, there's a Google search on our website that says, um, type in timber rivets, and it'll give you all the related questions to timber rivets, including where are timber rivets available, including split rings and shear plates, um, all, all types of helpful information. And also, the uh, I think they're giving you a link. Thanks, Brian, for providing the link to the audience. He gave you the link on where to go to. Um, also, as I mentioned, Appendix N is the only mandatory section um, and that deals with the load and resistance factor design. Now, also uh, some clarifications that have occurred in the appendix has to do with Appendix E, and there's a revised uh, example E.8. Um, we revised it by adding a check for the A critical um, and then adding this figure. Um, this is a critical a area critical for split rings and um, visually showing what we're talking about when we're talking about our uh, area for that type of connector, um, which is based on the distance from first and, and second split ring. So a clarification on, to make it easier to calculate. Also, new tables were added. Um, L5 was added, which is the post ring post frame ring shanks nails and I mentioned that previously in, earlier in the presentation and then um, also standard cut washers. There's some assumptions that are made and these are the standard cut washer assumptions and the physical dimensions of those uh, cut washers. <clears throat> and then also um, this was in the previous 2000 five NDS, um, and then, as I mentioned previously, the format conversion factor and the time effect factor is also included within the body of, I believe it was chapter two, so that um, you don't have to go to the appendix to look at this uh, for this. But uh, what has been revised is 
instead of in the previous edition of the 2005 NDS, we used to have an equation to calculate the K sub F. And now the actual um, values are incorporated into the table for um, Appendix N. That's why there's a, only the 2012 icon there to show you that that has changed. Commentary, I mentioned it several times throughout the presentation that if you have any questions, you want more in-depth information, the commentary provides a lot of in-depth information. Similarly with the uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic or the wind and seismic provision, the commentary provides a lot of in-depth information related to the um, document related to that. So an overview, um, we went over an uh, overview of how the specifications are adopted within the, uh, the IBC. We have an LRFD primer, went over that. Um, now um, also where you can get more, more information. But just quickly, the most notable changes that you probably saw are in Chapter 9 related to the glue lamb beams our shear um, and stress uh, factors. And um, Chapter 6 had the notable changes related to the tables. And also Chapter 12 um, related to the clarifications and the new additions of some tables that clarified the language, the text, the provisions within Chapter 12. So those are the major notable changes. Um, so if you're not dealing with these sections, then um, learning, uh, there's not a whole huge lot to, that have changed from the previous section. Um, so what does the future hold for the NDS? Well, we have all the uh, publications, the 2015 publications are now available on our website, the electronic versions. Um, this was a great effort from everybody at AWC to produce this, uh, these documents and to get it out on time. Uh, you'll note that the cover has changed and electronic versions, I mentioned this previously, the electronic versions of these documents are available for the first time ever for free on our website. It does not include the commentary. Um, they, they are read-only versions, but you can go to our website and maybe Brian will provide the link to where these are, but um, awc.org to get the actual documents and you can download those for free. Um, the graphics represent similar to what is in the 2015 IBC, which is also out for purchase. Um, in new to the NDS is the inclusion of cross laminated timber. If you are not familiar with cross laminated timber, this is a relatively new pretty new uh, wood, in, wood framing member which is cross laminated timber unlike glue lamb beams where, well light glue lamb beams where we have layers of laminations layered up to do, provide a layup of glue lamb beams where all the laminations are in one direction. Well cross laminated are just that, they're cross laminated. So you have various laminations but they're oriented 90 degrees to that. and. Um, I do have some pictures to show you. Um, this is the uh, first ever in the United States school that was built with cross-laminated cross timber. It's in West Virginia and the whole structure, the floors, the walls, and the roof is built out of cross-laminated timber. And this gives you a close-up look of what cross-laminated timber is. They come out as large panels, they're prefabricated and um, milled precisely using CNC technology. Uh, the prefabrication is what helps speed up the construction time for, uh, and the huge advantage of these members is the construction time that you would see savings time on the member, on projects. Um, this particular project, which is 46,200 square feet, uh, it was only took eight weeks to assemble the actual structure. Um, I believe it's supposed to be completed in, because of all the architectural, the MEP and everything finishing that needs to be done for this structure. Um, it's supposed to be completed, scheduled, that's another picture of it, it's supposed to be completed in 2015. So in the 2000, uh, 
15 NDS, that's the one big change. Um, there will be a renumbering of the chapters because we're adding cross laminated timber after wood structural panel, which so this will be chapter 11. Um, and then also for the wind and seismic provisions, um, there's been some changes related to diaphragms and, and analyzing of diaphragms, whether flexible or rigid, open front and cantilevered diaphragms. Some of you will um, are familiar with this when you're looking at um, mid-rise construction, some uh, clarifications of the language and how to um, reflect how structures are being analyzed um, in industry today. Um, this is a new document. Um, this is just an overview of the chapters. Um, remove the definition of flexible and rigid diaphragms. Um, that's already, uh, and then a clarification of that um, to be in line with ASCE 7 related to, um, and then uh, clearly defining what it means to be open diaphragm. Also incorporating some information related to sub diaphragms. And um, then also incorporating some clarifications related to when we're dealing with, for example, a tilt-up building where we have either a CMU wall or a masonry wall, and we need to tie those walls out of plane into the diaphragm for seismic loading so that those walls don't pull away from the diaphragm. Uh, some clarification of that uh, language and also in the provisions. And, um, regarding how you distribute the horizontal loads from to the shear walls from the diaphragm related to open front and cantilevered diaphragms. Um, also some clar clarification of the aspect ratios um, when we're exceeding the two to one aspect ratio. Um, we have the configurations, this so quickly look at some of the changes. This is the old di uh, diagrams. Now we're incorporating some new diagrams to really reflect what is happening in the industry. You see this figure D, which would reflect those type of structures where, for example, you're doing a hotel and then there's a corridor along the center. Um, this reflects that type of configuration of your diaphragm. So more clarifications on what's happening in, out in the um, industry. Um, and then we also will have some, so going back to the 2015 um, NDS and um, 2015 wind and seismic provisions, we are going to have a webinar in January. And I can't remember the date, maybe Dup Brian or uh, Suzanne will type that in. But on January, um, if you go to our website and go to the events tab, you will see um, we will have a webinar on the 2015 NDS, and I believe actually Suzanne mentioned that in the introduction. And then also later on in the year, we'll also have a webinar on the 2015 wind and seismic provisions and um, give you more information. Um, if you're interested in giving more in-depth information on the 2012 NDS, we have a white paper that gives you section by section, by section changes that was authored by Buddy Showalter, Brad Douglas, Phil Line, and Peter Mazikins. Sorry, Peter. Um, and then that was published in the January 2012 uh, Structure Magazine. The other thing to point out is if you go to our website, throughout our website where we have our publications, we have a What's Changed icon. Now, if you click on that, that will give you a, a white paper that can be downloaded for all of our publications that have um, uh, white paper on what's changed. We are working currently on the 2015 publications um, and then Buddy can help me out on when that will be available for public to view. So we are now at the end of our webinar and Buddy, if you're still with me, I am, Michelle. Thank you very much. That was very well done, and we have had a few questions coming in. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about changes to Southern Pine design values. I know we, we didn't uh, have a slide on that. We were concerned about time, but can you just give a brief uh, overview of the changes to uh, the Southern Pine design values that are in the new uh, 20, uh, in the new 2015 NDS, but uh, we're incorporated as an addendum to the 2012? 
Right. And maybe I'll toss that back to you if you don't mind. No, not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> um, there was some testing done um, in 2012. Um, actually started uh, before that um, on uh, lumber. And um, what we determined is that the uh, design values for southern pine uh, had been uh, affected. And so um, in addition to testing southern pine, then some additional testing was done on big fir, hemp fir, uh, and spruce pine fir as well. And at this point, um, the indications are that southern pine is the only uh, species that is um, having changes to design values. So for the 2012 NDS supplement, there is an addendum that you can download free from our website. And if you get the 2015 version, uh, which is also available free on our website, you'll have those changes incorporated as well. Some of the changes are pretty significant, um, as much as a 30% decrease in design values for certain grades of southern pine. So you need to be aware of that. Um, Michelle, can you talk a little bit more about uh, low duration factors and uh, the unique property of, of wood and low duration factors? We had a question about that in, uh, earlier in the presentation. Yes, uh, the low duration factor has to do with um, the how the capability of the wood member to resist certain loads over a certain amount of time and its ability depending on the length of time. Let me actually, I wonder if I could go back to that slide. Are we talking about, let me go back to that slide so that we can. Yeah, the. Um one of the uh, responses that I provided um, was, based on memory and what we have in the commentary, is that this um, property, uh, which is unique to wood, um, is really about wood's ability to carry a larger load over a shorter amount of time. And, and it was first, not only it was first observed, but uh, most notably observed in the British War when cannonballs were bouncing off the side of a ship. So <laughs> you know, we determined that impact load duration factor was real and testing, subsequent testing that's been done at the U.S. Forest Products Lab over the past 50, 100 years has verified uh, that as well. Yeah, I forgot that story about the cannonball. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so it's to take advantage of Wood's ability to withstand loads for certain periods of time. Hopefully. I think you in just the, answered the question. In Appendix B, there's also a graph that shows um, that relationship and shows how it becomes asymptotic after a certain uh, period of time. So if you turn, if you look at Appendix B, I think uh, for our users out there, they can see that graphically as well. And for those that let me no. uh, go ahead, Michelle. I was going to say, could you explain what was that word? Asymptotic. <laughs> Asymptotic, um, where it goes flat um, at about, that's why at, at 10 years um, it uh, flattens out and so right. the, the longer term low duration effect is, is flat after about 10 years. Okay. Um, there was, um, there's a question here that, that came up recently um, about uh, design values for screws in plywood or fasteners in plywood. And I think you showed a slide in Chapter 11 where we do provide a dowel bearing strength for right. fasteners in plywood and OSB. Right. Do you want me to turn to that? And what's the question? So it's well, for it's, less than... Are there design values for screws in the face of plywood? Um, I guess the the answer is we don't tabulate. Well, we actually may tabulate some values as well um, in some of the NDS tables for uh, plywood um, plywood members. Um, but this is for screws in the face of plywood. So I don't know if the question is ha having to do with whether that's a side member or a main member. But if it's not tabulated, the dowel bearing strength can be used to calculate uh, capacity for uh, fasteners in fiber OSB. Is this what? This is the one that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So is the question, can you calculate it, or maybe I'm not? Are there design yeah, values for screws in the face of plywood? Okay. Now I'm so I equipment to apply wood backing for shear and withdrawal. Okay. So the answer is yes. Yeah, because you use this dowel. Well, you're talking about withdrawal, though. This is for bearing. Yeah, the, the issue with withdrawal has is going to come down to penetration, and there are certain penetration depth factors. Well, that's that's an issue for lateral as well. So you have to meet the minimum embedment uh, requirements uh, for lateral resistance, and then make sure. I guess for withdrawal, I don't know if there are any minimums, but the threads have to to um, be able to, to bite into the wood members. So you have to make sure you've got enough there to to get some capacity. So if you're talking about, yeah, that's true. And then you're talking about, for example, wind out of plane on that wood sheeting. Uh -huh. There's the head of the member also that you're bearing against that plywood or wood structure. Correct. Yeah. Um, Michelle, we also need to clarify one slide um, on the repetitive member factor in Chapter 4. Uh, a couple of our real sharp, eagle-eyed participants caught this. Um, the slide said less than 24 inches on center, and that should be less than or equal to 24 inches on center for application of that repetitive member factor. So that's a good catch. Oh, very uh, good. If you have, yeah. Yeah, if you, have your, if you have your PDFs there and you want to mark that up, uh, change that over to less than or equal to 24 inches on center. Very good. All right, well, we're um, just about to the top of the hour, so I think we probably ought to have uh, Suzanne or come back or whoever's going to be finishing and wrapping up our presentation today.